Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here uh, uh, in Dundee. Uh, my first time in Scotland, I should say. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, and today we'll be talking about applied research in classrooms. Um, and well, this to give you an idea of what my plan was for today, um, for this talk, I will give a bit, uh, a bit of a background information to you about um, how I got involved into um, doing this kind of research or applied research in classroom settings. I'll give you some examples uh, uh, of um, applied research that has been done in classroom studies uh, at Avance University of Applied Sciences. And I will discuss some challenges that we are facing when doing the, uh, that type of research. Uh, and of course, there's always room for discussion, interaction. It's a small group, so feel free to intervene, interrupt, uh, ask questions. Uh, I don't have to do the whole talk uh, today or do the whole slideshow today. Uh, so just feel free uh, to say anything, uh, anytime you want. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the outline for today. And well, starting with, uh, with my background, actually. Um, so. In 1996 already, I uh, started studying psychology at the University of Maastricht. This is the uh, psychology building uh, that wasn't there at the time, by the way. Uh, and Maastricht University in the Netherlands uh, is, is the youngest university, and it's a university with a very strong reputation in innovation, uh, in uh, education reform, actually. Uh, so it was the first university that introduced small group learning uh, by using problem-based learning, a very specific form of problem-based learning that is. And that was also uh, the dominant uh, educational approach when I was there at the psychology department. Uh, I graduated as a master's of science in um, cognitive psychology uh, with a specialization in educational psychology. And looking back, I think it would be more appropriate to call the master's degree that I obtained uh, specialization in applied cognitive psychology. It was very much about applying principles from cognitive psychology into educational practice. Um, and after my graduation, uh, I stayed in Maastricht. I moved on to uh, to this department, the Department of Methodology and Statistics. Uh, I had applied for uh, a PhD uh, position there, and it was actually uh, a PhD position uh, that would focus on a project uh, on education innovation. Uh, and while well, the global aim was to, uh, well, to find out what we should do to enhance motivation and learning um, of uh, university students who took statistics courses because you had huge problems with motivation and learning, especially for the, the people that were taught by my colleagues from the statistics department because they, they didn't teach statistics uh, majors, they uh, taught uh, uh, statistics to psychology students, uh, health sciences students, students in medicine. And well, uh, the question was how could we uh, resolve these motivation and learning problems? Uh, and I started working there, I started working from, I don't know if anyone is familiar with this picture, which you can see, which you can hardly see from the distance, I would say, this is the four components instructional design model by Jeroen van Marienburg. It's a very cognitive approach to, uh, to designing instruction, but it tries to integrate uh, all kinds of principles from, edu from educational psychology and cognitive psychology into instructional design. Um, the core idea is that you have to use uh, whole task practice with authentic tasks, um, and that you start out with relatively uh, uh, less complex tasks, that you, uh, that you increase complexity, um, and uh, that you decrease teacher support. In the beginning, you have a lot of structure, a lot of support, but it should uh, diminish when you move on in education or in the educational cycle. Um, and uh, you have to integrate supportive information, as they call it, into your instructional design. And that means that you have to uh, make sure that uh, people uh, build up the knowledge that is necessary to uh, be competent in the complex skill that you're training, because it's a model for training complex cognitive skills. So I started working from that theoretical framework. I wrote my introduction for my uh, thesis. I also did uh, one study there, actually. My first study was in the Journal of Statistics Education. It was kind of a correlational study. Um, but when I was working, I was asked by my former mentor, Hank Schmidt, um, uh, to join him to go to Rotterdam, because he was uh, being asked to go there to the Erasmus University, and you see the campus right here, uh, to, uh, to build uh, a new uh, curriculum, new psychology department, actually. Uh, and I had some doubts whether I should do that. Actually, my uh, professor uh, at Maastricht said that, that I would be committing academic suicide when doing so, and he told it actually for a good reason, because my job in Rotterdam was mainly educational in nature. So I had to, uh, together with, uh, with, with a few other people, 
all people from the University uh, of Maastricht, with the exception of Evelyn here in the middle. Uh, we're all actually quite young people then. Most of us just uh, graduated or just finishing uh, PhDs. Uh, only Hank here in the middle, he was the, the, the senior staff member, the professor who, who was the, the, the building dean actually there of the psychology department. But we had to build up uh, uh, an entirely new uh, psychology curriculum. So we had to design the courses, um, we had to teach the courses as well. We had to design an assessment uh, program, all these things. Um, and of course, it's, it's uh, difficult to do, to do that and, um, and at the same time finish a PhD project. Uh, but there, at least, my enthusiasm for teaching also uh, started. So uh, I was very much involved in teaching. And I'm still today uh, at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. But I mainly teach statistics courses, by the way. Um, and well, while I started working uh, in Rotterdam as an assistant professor, I also uh, wrote my PhD thesis. But this time I started out with actually um, um, a topic on metacognition. Um, but I, I had difficulties replicating the, uh, the original finding uh, on which I wanted to build. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I should leave that behind and move on to a topic that is quite robust. So I began to search the literature and I ended up with um, spacing effect. I thought, well, that, that sounds, seems to be a very robust finding. Uh, and it's related to, uh, to distributed practice. Of, uh, and probably maybe you're familiar with that, but it's a memory finding. The idea that when you um, space repetitions of information in time, you will remember uh, the information better than when you cram all these learning sessions uh, consecutively. So uh, spacing is, is much better for memory. And also, that's what what people found later on for understanding, for inductive reasoning, uh, than cramming. So I started to work uh, on, this, uh, um, on this topic, uh, exploring various explanations of the spacing effect, but since the research I did was very fundamental in, re in, in nature. Uh, so I was uh, working in a psychological lab. Uh, people in my experiments had to learn word lists of unrelated words, uh, short learning sequences. I measured memory, and I investigated several explanations of uh, the spacing effect. For instance, this is from my first paper in which uh, we investigated uh, the contextual variability account of the spacing effect in free recall for word lists. Uh, so very fundamental in nature. And after I finished my PhD, I, I continued working uh, on, this, on, on this topic. I even published papers quite recently about this topic. Um, but was, I also got interested in, uh, in, in a different topic that's related to the spacing effect. Uh, namely uh, retrieval practice or the testing effect as it's known. So the idea that when you retrieve information from memory, uh, the memory for the information will be strengthened uh, compared to when you restudy the information over and over again. And my interest was actually triggered by uh, a, a paper that's now a classic, a uh, paper by uh, uh, Henry Rudiger and Jeff Carpicky, appeared in 2006 in Psychological Science and it gives you brief outline of their results. What they did, people had to uh, study prose passages, so short, uh, very short texts. Um, and uh, they did that according to different regimes. So some people had to study uh, this uh, passage four times in a row. Uh, others studied it uh, thrice and uh, tested themselves once. So that's uh, one retrieval practice uh, phase in the learning, uh, in the, in the learning, uh, uh, learning phase. And the others, they studied just once and tested themselves three times. And this was the results. Uh, these were the results, or it's a schematic uh, representation of their results. What you show, what you, what they found was that um, multiple study uh, um, opportunities were better at uh, after a five-minute uh, delay than um, when you learn with a retrieval practice. But if you wait a while one week, so after one week delay, the pattern flipped. And that's a, a typical pattern for uh, uh, the retrieval uh, practice effect. So I started studying that as well, but again in a very uh, fundamental setting, so using word lists, short learning sequences. Uh, but it was always something a bit that, that bothered me a bit, because um, I always, uh, well, I'm an educational psychologist also by training, and I was missing actually the application of my work uh, in um, in practice, so I started to uh, think uh, about ways of how I could do that. And well, one opportunity arose um, in 2009, actually, when when the when Bohr, 
Het bestuur openbaar onderwijs Rotterdam, so the governing board of public education uh, in Rotterdam, for the municipality of Rotterdam, um, uh, they developed a talent development, uh, or they initiated a talent development program. Um, and uh, there are over more than 30,000 children in primary and secondary uh, uh, education uh, associated uh, with the schools that uh, that are represented by this board. Um, and they were looking, uh, well, they, they, they launched this talent development initiative because they wanted to solve all kinds of problems, especially in um, uh, low SAS neighborhoods, which you have a lot of in Rotterdam, and there are all kinds of problems. And uh, the initiative uh, comprised many different things. So you had uh, a remedial teaching program, uh, extracurricular tutoring. Um, it was there were, were initiatives to, uh, to strengthen the connection between school and neighborhood, between schools and parents, and also, and that's where we came into play. They wanted to provide teachers with some evidence about, um, well, uh, evidence uh, informed uh, practice in a way. So they wanted to, uh, one goal was to um, equip teachers with insights from cognitive and educational psychology that might be useful for them in their classroom. And therefore they, they, contact, they contacted us. So uh, my colleagues and me from the Department of Psychology at Erasmus University. Uh, and one thing we did is we wrote this book uh, together with uh, primary school teachers. Um, and probably you, you can't figure out what, what, what it says here. It, it says, teams oefen strategieën uit de geheugenpsychologie voor de klas. And it needs uh, 10 practice strategies from memory psychology that you can use in the classroom. That's for primary school education. So we wrote this together with, te with the teachers. And what we did, um, actually our task was to, uh, to think of uh, strategies that uh, could be used in uh, primary school practice and for which there was sufficient empirical evidence that it would work for learning. Um, and uh, what we did, we, 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 we first uh, looked up these principles. Um, and we categorized them because uh, that, would, this, what, that was what the teachers uh, found very uh, um, practically, practically relevant according to learning goals. So this learning goals, beta onthouden means uh, remembering better. And you have several strategies that are associated with uh, things that you can do to help students remember things better. And this one here, niet stampen maar spreiden, that refers to uh, the spacing effect. And this one over here, niet opnieuw bestuderen, maar ophalen uit het geheugen, refers to retrieval practice. But we also had some strategies for better understanding. For instance, this one is self-explaining, asking questions, enacting, read, recite, review. And we had uh, strategies focusing on application. So this one is uh, focusing on the approach instead of the solution. So uh, the world example effect, actually. Uh, this is uh, diminishing support, so scaffolding. So you start with a structured environment and you build off the scaffold uh, when, the te when the learner builds up expertise. And this is interleaved practice or uh, variation in practice. Um, and what we did, we... Um, uh, we, well, we, we wrote uh, down what this strategy entailed and the teachers, they, uh, they added uh, their experience they had in real classroom with using these strategies. So they described, for instance, how they used uh, retrieval practice in their vocabulary lesson or how they used enactment while uh, helping students to, uh, to learn from text. And they gave plenty of examples. Uh, actually, that's what most of the book is made of, many examples of how teachers use these strategies in practice. And we, as, as academics, we also wrote down what the active ingredients were. So uh, what the theoretical background is for all these uh, techniques. And some reference for teachers who were interested in that. So this is actually my first experience actually working with teachers in a research-like uh, setting. We also did um, actual research in primary school classroom. So there was one PhD student uh, doing research uh, uh, trying to uh, apply retrieval practice and spacing uh, in vocabulary learning. Uh, so primary school school students, and another one focused on enactment. Um, but the project ended in uh, 2014, beginning of 2014. Uh, but luckily I had the opportunity to work again with teachers and practice at uh, Avance University of Applied Sciences, where I became a, a lector, that's a Dutch uh, term, and well, professor of applied sciences is 
probably the, the best uh, translation. Uh, and uh, there we work with uh, Electorat, it's a research group, and that consists mainly of uh, teachers. And Avanz University of Applied Sciences is a non-research university where people are trained to become uh, uh, professionals, it's higher vocational education as it's called in Dutch, I don't know if that term rings a bell for you here. Uh, but it's, at least it's, 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 uh, it's uh, a, a, a non-research university. Um, and the people I work with there are, are, like I said, are mainly teachers. And what we do amongst others is classroom research. And it has a certain, it, it's, it always starts in the same way. So it starts with challenges that these teachers themselves face in their own educational practice. And the only, well, the only requirement is that the challenges should, should be related to motivation and learning. Well, that's always the case. And all, or to critical thinking, because uh, these are, uh, both of them are uh, important themes in uh, higher vocational education in the Netherlands. So there are a lot of problems with motiva motivating and, um, and, and learning in, uh, especially in the first year of these uh, four year bachelor programs and with critical thinking. So as long as the challenges are related to one of uh, these two or both, then, then you're okay. And what we then do, we try to design evidence-informed interventions. So uh, uh, we use evidence from cognitive and educational psychology um, to, uh, well, to, to design interventions that we implement in the classroom. Um, and what we then do, we try to uh, set up a systematic evaluation of these interventions. Uh, so that means conducting uh, various kinds of uh, classroom studies. And ideally, uh, when you uh, went through all these uh, three first steps, you end up with some evidence-based practice. So this is the uh, ideal scenario, what we, and this is how we work uh, there at, uh, at this brain and learning research group. The term brain, by the way, is maybe somewhat misleading because it suggests that we're neuropsychologists, but we aren't. But it has some kind of, uh, well, um, historical roots, I would say. Um, and it traces back to the time when people thought that brain-based learning was the thing to do. And maybe it is a thing to do, but uh, I'm mostly concerned with learning. Um, so this is what we do there. And uh, my job there is actually to give uh, these teachers a the a theoretical frameworks that they can use to think about interventions and about the problems in their education and to help them with the systematic evaluation. And when it comes to um, the theoretical framework, um, well, the main goal actually, uh, that we, uh, but one of the main goals is that we uh, should help uh, students to build up meaningful knowledge uh, structures. And well, from cognitive and educational psychology, uh, some of the learning strategies that help for that have been known. Uh, and this one, you might recognize this one, I don't know. This is uh, from a paper by John Donlosky and colleagues. It's a very frequently cited paper. Uh, it was actually a paper with, uh, with, written with the same idea as that we had with our toolbox. So the idea is that you um, well make a, a qualitative review of uh, learning techniques or learning strategies uh, from cognitive and educational psychology that could be easily used by educators and by learners uh, to improve learning. Um, and they review uh, this set, but this is, this is a restricted set. There are more, of course, there are more uh, strategies than these. But these are important, and there is a lot of evidence for all these um, techniques. Uh, and what uh, John Donlosky and colleagues also did is that they made a utility ranking, a very general utility ranking uh, that says something about um, how useful these strategies are for educational practice. And they use a number of criteria to get to this ranking. Uh, and uh, for instance, they look at uh, how general the effect is. Um, so uh, has it been found with, uh, with different measures, with different populations, with different materials, in different conditions? Uh, and based on that, they, uh, they give uh, a kind of a judgment. So uh, as you can see here, practice testing and distributed uh, testing, uh, they come up very highly on this list because it has been found with, uh, with many different student populations, with many different materials, with many different outcome measures. So therefore they say, well, it's probably a strategy that you could uh, use in education to enhance learning. Um, and this is a very general uh, evaluation. Uh, it might be different by, for higher education or for primary education, because for instance, summarization uh, gets a low utility ranking, but I would say that for higher education, summar summarization is probably a very useful uh, technique. 
Uh, but these kinds of techniques are the techniques that uh, we try to promote uh, in our um, in uh, in, uh, in our classroom practice and in the research that we're conducting. And you see similar strategies, by the way, if you're interested in. Um, this book by, uh, by two educational psychologists, Logan Fiorella and Richard, Richard Mayer, and it's called Learning as a Generative uh, Activity. And they, they come up uh, basically with, with, with many similar um, uh, techniques, and they, well, they, they reach the same conclusions about the utility, I would say. Uh, so what we do uh, with this Brain and Learning Research Group, one thing we do is we try uh, to think of ways of how we uh, could promote these kinds of learning activities in our education. Um, and I will give you some examples of, uh, of how we do that. Um, so for instance, um, this is my colleague Anton den Boer. Uh, he has a, a, a doctorate in, uh, in physics. So he, he's a physics doctor, he's way smarter than I am, but he's not an educational scientist. Uh, and, but he's very much interested in, in, uh, in, in ways of, uh, of, uh, of improving his own education. Uh, what he uh, teaches, uh, one, one uh, course he teaches is a material science course, and that's a first year course in the mechanical engineering program. So you have a lot of engineering programs at advance, and um, material science is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is a central course, actually, in, in, uh, in these uh, engineering um, uh, programs. And well, the challenge he faces, and, and well, for any teacher, that's a familiar one, I would say, is, is academic procrastination. So students tend to delay their studying efforts uh, until uh, just before the end of course exam. And that's problematic because then they tend to cram instead of space, uh, and the latter would be m much better for learning than the, the former. Uh, but what is also problematic, if people um, uh, procrastinate, they're typically not well prepared for uh, the, the scheduled lessons. Uh, and the preparation is often requ is always required, I would say, to, to get to meaningful uh, processing of the materials. So Anton was thinking about ways of how he could uh, prevent this procrastination from occurring. And um, he thought about using uh, retrieval practice or uh, in the form of assessment during his course. And he came across the study by uh, Kerdijk and colleagues. Uh, and uh, Serge, I think Serge Kerdijk is, but anyways, Kerdijk and his colleagues work at uh, Groningen University at uh, a medical school. And they have come up with, uh, well, a, a fairly new form of using assessment uh, during your course. Because using uh, interspersing assessments in your course is not new. There's a long history of using testing in courses. And actually uh, a, a successful history because many studies have, sh have shown that it works. Uh, but this cumulative compensatory assessment, which I will call CCA from now, um, is, is a, it's a new form. What it means is that you, uh, you have several assessments throughout a course. They're all small stakes. Uh, and um, well, the, uh, the assessment uh, tests everything that has been thought until that moment. Uh, so build, the, the content builds up uh, when you move through the course. Uh, so that's the cumulative part. It's compensatory because uh, what happens is that a set of uh, assessments are combined into a single grade, um, so you can compensate for uh, less optimal performances on one or maybe, maybe even more assessments. And the idea is that that would keep uh, motivation uh, at a reasonable level, because it, without the compensation, well, motivation would drop if you fill one of the uh, assessments. And they had actually quite positive experience with that, experiences with that in Groningen. Uh, so Anton thought, well, maybe I can use that uh, or a variant of what they did in Groningen in my own course, so the material science course. So that's what he did. And actually, he conducted two experiments, one uh, with uh, the cohort of 2016-2017 and one with the cohort of 2017 and 2018. Uh, and just to give you an idea what this course is uh, so it's uh, it's it's uh, it's one course within the first quarter. So at Advanced University, you have four quarters, uh, of course, four quarters of ten weeks each, and uh, and you have parallel education. So in each quarter, you have many you have various courses, and in this case, uh, the material science course is one course in the in the first uh, first quarter, and it has a course load of uh, fifty six hours. Um, well, it takes uh, eight weeks in total. The last two weeks are reserved for um, resits. Um, and 
what the students have, they have uh, seven times uh, two hour meetings. So one two hour meeting per week in which uh, they come together, the, the students come together with a teacher, discuss assignments, work on assignments. And they also have, uh, I think, two hour lecture per week. Um, and the final course exam is in week eight. And when you look at the student characteristics, they're mainly male students. 97% is male. Uh, most of them uh, are 70 years of age, but well, they have uh, the, the, the maximum age in this course was 26. And in secondary education, they mainly had a, a technical background. So many of them had mathematics, uh, physics, and chemistry in their background. So very uh, a population that, that is very interested in doing tec technical things. Um, and in uh, the first experiment that took uh, place in 2016, 2017, the whole cohort uh, took part. Uh, everyone gave uh, their in informed consent. And what happened, uh, well, students were randomly assigned to four classes. You had te two teachers, uh, and classes were randomly assigned to a teacher. And within the teacher, um, the classes uh, were randomly assigned to be the uh, cumulative assessment group or the control group. And I will tell you what that means. Uh, and what we measured, we had a pre-course uh, uh, pre intake uh, in which we uh, obtained informed consent uh, and sample characteristics. In, during uh, halfway, we asked them to report study time, so the time that they, uh, they spent self-studying on uh, this course. Uh, Self-efficacy, so uh, how, uh, how well they thought they would be able to, uh, to, to be successful on the exam. And topic interest. And we measured uh, their performance at the end of course exam and also uh, on a delayed exam, which was 12 weeks later at the start of actually of a material science two, which was a follow-up course. Um, and we plan to uh, analyze the study time and the end of course exam. So actually we hope that students would do more in the experimental condition and in the control condition. And we hope that they would perform better uh, because that was the idea. The idea is that cumulative assessment would enhance retrieval practice, uh, would enhance space practice, uh, and therefore would have a positive effect on these two outcome measures. Um, and this is what happened. So the, the procedure in the experimental condition, uh, uh, you can see here. So what you see here is uh, the lessons in that course um, and the content of these lessons. And you had six uh, cumulative assessments. And you can see that the content uh, of these uh, assessment increases. Uh, so uh, for the first assessment, it was only chapter one and two. For the sep second, it was one, two, and three so on. So this, here, here you see the cumulative nature. Uh, students took these tests um, after the two-hour meeting, took them one hour, they, they took the exam uh, on a computer, and they got, got immediate feedback on their performance. So they, they received a grade on a 10-point scale. And what uh, Anton or his colleague also did was afterwards uh, explain uh, each assignment from uh, the assessment uh, by using a worked example. So they had also worked example feedback on all the uh, items on the assessment. And here you can see an example uh, of an item from an assessment. If you're not a material scientist, then probably doesn't ring a bell, but this is what they did. Uh, they, uh, it, it were mainly short answer um, uh, questions that they had to, uh, had to do. Um, and in the control condition, actually the same happened. But the only difference was that, um, well, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the performance on the, the assessments didn't add up for the final grade. Uh, so in uh, the experimental condition, it did. Uh, what happened was the best, uh, out of, uh, the best five out of the six assignments were averaged, and these counted for 30% of the final grade. In the control condition, students did exactly the same thing, but it was not mandatory. And, um, well, the performance on the cumulative assessments didn't count for the final grade. So in a way, it was a kind of a, format a purely formative assessment procedure in the control condition. Yeah. So this was, was what happened. So it was a, um, a actually, actually a field experiment in the classroom. Um, and the results. Um, so Anton and his colleague did some, also made some observations. Of course, this is not really, these are not hardcore results, but nevertheless, I think it's good to share. 
um, what they noted was that, well, the motivation or engagement was higher in uh, the CCA group than in the control group. But of course, well, uh, it's, it's always difficult what you, what you make out of that because uh, maybe, well, Anton and his colleague had positive experiences, right, about this treatment. So maybe this, they were seeing this uh, without things actually happening. Um, the students, in any case, appreciated the feedback that they received. They, they liked this procedure a lot, actually in both conditions. So in the CCA condition and the control condition, students liked this uh, uh, addition to their course. But what we also saw that the interest in the formative uh, assessment waned in the control group. So in the beginning, everyone uh, was there, but uh, when the sixth uh, cumulative assessment was done, uh, half of the group uh, appeared. So, well, you had a clear uh, drop of interest there. Um, and there were no effects on self-reported self-study time, self-efficacy, and topic interest. Uh, so self-efficacy was reasonably high, topic interest was reasonably high, and actually self-reported study time was also, well, compared to other courses, also reasonably high. And when you look at um, what we found on the end of course exam, you see a small uh, advantage for the experimental group, but it was not significant. At the delay test, we found a huge adv uh, advantage, which was significant. But as you might see here, uh, the ends were much smaller. Uh, so in part, that was due to students dropping out. But also, uh, it was due to uh, the fact that this was not a mandatory session. Um, and well, some students simply didn't show up in this, uh, in this situation. And there might be some selective dropout, right? So uh, this might look promising because there are also theoretical reasons to, to believe that maybe effects of retrieval practice and testing will show up after a delay. Um, but well, maybe there was something else going on, maybe selective attrition or things like that. So we thought, well, we have to do uh, another experiment. And this time we, um, what we will do is uh, do the same thing, um, but we will do a pre-registration. Um, so uh, pre-registration uh, means that you register beforehand what your hypothesis are, uh, what your uh, plan is, and it's a very good thing to do. Actually, you can look it up if you're interested on this side of the open science framework. Uh, you can see what we, um, what we did. And we compared formative cumulative assessment to summative cumulative assessment. Actually, the procedure was exactly the same as in the um, as in the first experiment, with the only with a few exceptions, we uh, used three assessments throughout the course for practical reasons, um, and um, we asked students to report self-study time before each uh, cumulative assessment, and uh, we made sure that the delay test was mandatory, so that we didn't have didn't have these problems with, uh, with possible problems with selective attrition, um, and what we found. Uh, at least when you look at these results together. We, uh, experiment two, uh, well, we, we, we didn't fi find any um, uh, differences between the two conditions in preparation time, and also we didn't find differences in self-efficacy. However, I should note in preparation time, there was some kind of trend visible. What you saw was that self-study time increased a bit, actually, in the uh, summative uh, cum cumulative assessment group, whereas it decreased in the other group, uh, but it was not entirely statistically significant, so it's, well, maybe an interesting finding to follow up. Um, and self-efficacy uh, was the same for both, uh, for both groups. Um, and when we looked at the end of course exam, we found uh, a small advantage, again, for the uh, summative group uh, that was not significant. When we looked at them together, we did a small random effects uh, meta-analysis, we find a small advantage um, of 0.3 35 on a 10 point scale, which is small in terms of Cohen's D, uh, for the summative group. So if you have a cumulative assessment, well, the, the performance at the end of the test tends to be somewhat higher for the summative group. It was not significant, at least not when you test two tailed, um, and it was a small effect. Um, so we thought, well, what, what should we do now? Because actually, uh, many teachers were in favor of the, the summative approach. They said, well, we need the summative aspect uh, to make sure that there are sufficient uh, incentives to, uh, to, to, to make these assessments in a serious way. Uh, but at the same time, the results were not very convincing. 
Uh, so we thought, well, maybe we can do uh, a formative assessment because there are, well, there are all kinds of advantages uh, of, of taking the formative approach. For instance, it's also it's easier to implement because summative assessment uh, come with all kinds of regulations that you have to adhere to, uh, and you don't have to with, have that with uh, uh, with uh, formative assessments. And you have issues that are related to test anxiety, uh, maybe, uh, or teaching to the test, which you get with summative assessment, but not with formative assessment. So we thought, well, maybe we can do, um, oh, and on a delayed exam, by the way, for no difference between the conditions in the second experiments. So actually, I tend to say that what we found in the first one was uh, an artifact. Um, so uh, what we now do is, is actually use a similar approach, but try to increase the feedback. Uh, so um, we, we gave feedback on uh, performance, on the process, so how you should solve the problem. But we now are thinking also uh, of adding some uh, feedback uh, to that that would be related to self-regulation. So helping students how to uh, plan for these exams using the right uh, uh, strategies and do that more in a targeted way. So now because now the whole group was always targeted, but uh, we're planning to, uh, well, to use the data that come in from these cumulative assessments to target students who, uh, who tend to be at risk. And Anton wrote a proposal for that. I just checked my avance email and I saw that the decision was, was there, but I didn't read it. So afterwards, I'm going to check whether Anton actually uh, gets, uh, would get his funding for this project he's planning. But this is, uh, is something that he wants to do next. And actually, he wants to do that for a good reason, using this formative approach with, this, with all this kind of feedback. Because one of his colleagues, um, you see him here, Michael Meyers. Uh, he had some. He was. He had some quite uh, interesting and successful experiences with using uh, formative assessment in his uh, first year course. And the first year course is a dynamics course, uh, which he also teaches to uh, engineering students. Uh, very important course, central course in an engineering program. Um, and well, students, uh, it's, it's, and it's also a very difficult course. So uh, uh, the, the pass rates of the exams are very low. Uh, it's, it's very complex materials. Uh, so, um, uh, well, students struggle in this course. And um, what students also uh, indicated, uh, well, they indicated that to, to, uh, to Michael here, that they had limited insight in the progress they were making throughout the course. And that was due to the way the course was set up. So people uh, had to do uh, all kinds of assignments in which they had to uh, solve all kinds of dynamics problems. Um, uh, but the, the feedback was always presented one week later on a Blackboard PDF sheet. And uh, well, students wanted to have direct feedback and, and wanted to actually that, that uh, well, that the teaching would be adapted uh, based on um, on on how well they performed on certain uh, assignments uh, so michael thought about ways of of doing that and he uh, he came up with with a specific form of formative assessment and what he did um, one thing he did is he used uh, an ict tool of uh, the publisher uh, of the textbook that he's uh, using in this course um, so what students have to do um, and you can see it here on masteringengineering.com. Um, um, so he, he started using this. Uh, before, he, uh, he, he, he gave students these kinds of assignments. Uh, so, well, I'm not uh, a, 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 an engineer, so I'm, it's very hard to understand what ha what's, hap what's happening here, what you should do. Maybe I can get some idea based on my uh, high school physics. But this is what they have to do. Um, and uh, they did, usually they did that on paper. But now they uh, worked on these assignments in this, uh, in this online tool. Uh, so what you do, you, you simply get this assignment and you have to uh, give a solution. Um, but the interesting thing here is that you get immediate feedback. So um, if you don't, uh, if you if you have to have an incorrect solution, the system says, well, um, it is this isn't correct. Uh, you have some attempts remaining. And what's interesting is that um, uh, when you try again, um, the hints that you get, the the feedback hints, they uh, increase in learner support. And to give you a bit of an idea how that works, so for instance, the first hint is just uh, referring to the formula that you had to use. So think again about this formula. Um, you can, re in some cases, you even uh, have a reference to the book, read it again, 
and try to see whether you can uh, solve the problem now. I guess that doesn't work a lot of times because usually students did that already. Uh, and then you move on to uh, the next hint, which gives you some more uh, support. And if you don't, if you fail again, then uh, you get uh, yet another hint. Um, so uh, the hints build up in, in, in uh, the kind of feedback that they give or the kind of uh, guidance. Uh, and <clears throat> the idea is to help students um, through the assignments in this way. Mm. So it's a very interesting uh, form of feedback. I would say students get direct feedback, uh, but they don't get the worked, uh, worked out solution immediately, uh, but they are uh, motivated to, uh, to come up with the solution themselves. Of course, as a student, you can simply click through. Uh, that's always what you have with these systems, but in a way, it's, well, the attempt is good, I would say. So Michael used this system, um, and what he also did is, did is using the uh, analytics that came from the system. Uh, because uh, the system produces all kinds of uh, input about how students uh, are doing on these assignments. So, for instance, here in this uh, in this uh, part of uh, the screenshot, you see, this is a mock-up version, by the way. This, those are not real students. Here, you can see how student how well students did on the assignments that you gave them. For instance, here could you say, well, the average of all the assignments that I gave, the average correct score was uh, sixty-five percent. What you can also see here is how difficult each of these assignments, uh, each of the, uh, the, the several items in the assignment were. Uh, and you could also see how much time each individual student had spent on these assignments. And, um, uh, which of the uh, and he had a rank order of successfulness, how well students did on the assignment. And Michael used this information to adapt his teaching. Um, uh, so what he did, for instance, he used this information uh, to focus on those aspects of the assignments that were not well understood. And uh, that's not what he did previously. He simply covered everything. Uh, but now he could focus with this information. And what he also did uh, is he created um, a remedial teaching group for students who were lagging behind. So uh, if he saw that, that, that some students had spent very little time on the assignments for a few assignments in a row and were performing very poorly or a combination of both, uh, then he invited them uh, to come to the remedial teaching group and he tried to assist them in, um, uh, well, helping them out. And it could be, uh, well, uh, one hand for some people, it could be trying to motivate them. Um, so that was one thing. For the others, uh, for other students, it would mean uh, some uh, extra explanation of, uh, of the course materials themselves. Um, so it's actually a combination here of uh, using this online tool to give immediate feedback to the students, but also to adapt your teaching and to target uh, specific groups of students. Um, and he did that, and actually he conducted a small pilot experiment himself. Um, so what happened here, he, he, thought, he thought all of these classes were three classes, relatively small group uh, in this case. Uh, people were randomly assigned to the classes, and you had two classes which received the regular instruction. So things that he did, uh, th that was the instruction that he, uh, he was using uh, for, for a few years, in which students made the assignments um, on paper and got fe feedback later on through the PDF file with worked out, with worked example solution. And this was the group that uh, got his formative feedback treatment. And what he found was quite astonishing, actually. Uh, because when you look here, uh, actually the classes A and B show a typical result for the passing rate. Uh, so uh, one is fail, uh, one is fail, one is pass, zero is fail. And what you see here is, well, the average passing percentage is about, well, 35%, 30%. So, and that was in line with what they had years in a row. Uh, so this was actually not a surprise. What was a surprise was this that the pattern literally flipped. So he was, he was really amazed that this happen, happened. And well, it, sound, it, it looks very promising at least. But he's also, he's a, uh, he's a physicist. Um, and he thought, well, one experiment, uh, that's, not, that's not enough, right? In psychology, you don't do that, right? You don't publish single experiments with small samples, or do you? <laughs> so he said, well, uh, I should, actually, I have to do a replication to see whether this is correct, uh, whether we can find it again. And uh, together with, with Michael, we wrote a proposal uh, to get funding for such a replication so that he could do this 
uh, in, uh, well, actually in this year he's going to do that, um, in his classroom, and he's going to extend his treatment to other classes. So there are people uh, uh, doing statistics classes uh, in his department who are also interested and who use uh, similar systems uh, as, as Michael does in his course, and they will join as well. So we wrote a proposal for, um, um, for a Comenius Beurs, as it's called. So that's from uh, NRO, and that's affiliated with the Netherlands uh, sci uh, Organization for Scientific Research. And they, uh, well, this is the, the main funding uh, uh, organization in the Netherlands. And they now created also um, a funding for uh, teachers who wanted to conduct uh, research in their classroom. So I think it's a very good initiative. And one of the initiatives is the Comenius Teaching Fellowship. And uh, Michael applied for that, and he, uh, his project uh, got the prize and got to be funded. Um, and what we are going to do, we do a pre-registered replication of uh, the study I showed you before, and a generalization, and we have to see what comes out. Um, and, well, and, and if it works, then we can maybe even uh, broaden our scope further. Uh, but this, it seems to be promising. But it's also a, a quite an uh, teaching uh, intensive approach because, well, you have to target individual students. It doesn't take him that much extra time, but it takes him some extra time. And you need to have that time. But I will get to that later on uh, when I talk about the challenges. So this is another project, actually. And, and, and in this project, uh, well, you could say with this formative assessment, you tr also try to promote uh, repeated practice, uh, but here's also many other things that, that are effective, like this individual feedback, I would say, is very important here. And what I think is an interesting thing here is that, that Michael uses these uh, learning analytics in a very uh, good way. Um, so this is the second example I wanted to share with you. And the final example um, is, uh, is one by uh, Marloes Broere. She's a teacher at the Academy of communication and user experience um, and uh, well she, she's also a PhD student so she started as a, uh, a PhD student as a teacher uh, and and this is her first study actually that that will tell you a bit about and she did that in her marketing course uh, first year course and actually she started uh, she was inspired by a study that was recently published by Robert Ariel and Jeff Carpicky in the Journal of Experimental Psychology Applied and what they did there was quite remarkable, I would say, or what they found was quite remarkable. Um, so what they tried to do, they tried to enhance the self-regulated use of retrieval practice, RP. Um, because that's, a, that's a, an important question. The question is, how can you, what should you do to make sure that students are going to use effective learning strategies on, uh, out of their own, uh, out of their own, so um, in their uh, individual study? And, well, uh, Ariel and Karpicky uh, give some indication of what might work. Uh, and what they did, uh, and I will tell you about their second experiment, they had a, it was just a lab experiment in which, in experiment in which people had to learn uh, Lithuanian English word pairs. Um, and uh, well, they, they created two groups. In one group, uh, one group was uh, told that retrieval, what retrieval practice was, and that it would work very well for remembering these uh, Lithuanian English word pairs. Uh, the other group was simply told that they should do their best and remember as many of these pairs as possible. Um, and they had a first session in which uh, students could make a selection. They could decide for each of these pairs whether they want to study them, drop them, so not study them at all, or do retrieval practice on them. And I forgot to say one thing, Ariel and Karpiki also told uh, their participants in one condition that they had to retrieve each word at least three times correctly, and, and then the effect would be strongest. Yeah. So what they found in this first session with these explicit instruction was that people did what they told them uh, to do. So in the retrieval practice instruction condition, people retrieved words more often um, than in the control condition. And in the first condition, people also performed better on the final test. But the crucial uh, part of their experiment came a week, li uh, a week later in their um, uh, transfer session, the second session. And in that session, um, 
people were asked, uh, they weren't told nothing at all. They were just told, well, just learn these new uh, Lithuanian English words and well, do whatever you want to. So then you have a tiny amount of self-regulated practice that you expect from students. And what they found uh, there was that students who had this retrieval, had had the retrieval practice instruction a week earlier, they still uh, used retrieval practice more often during that crucial uh, third session. And Ariel and Karpiki, based on that result, right, well, this might be very promising for educational practitioners. So actually, and, well, it sounds almost too simple to be true, right? So you just inform them, say, well, retrieval practice is good, do it three times, and they go ahead and do it. Uh, so we thought, well, if that would work, that it would be great because it would be a minimal intervention um, with potentially very large effects. So Balusi tried to test that in her course, the marketing course. Um, and what she did, is what you see here on this display. She will present this also, um, uh, and I got this from her poster. Um, so, uh, so she used the entire cohort this year. Uh, no, last year, sorry, it was in, in May last year. Uh, it's a marketing course, and in this marketing course, one thing that people have to learn are uh, key concepts about marketing. So they're basically, they're just definitions. Um, and while well, you had uh, an experimental group, which received the retrieval practice condition, and a control group which received uh, neutral instructions about blended learning and how, how important it was to learn in an online environment. Because we created an online environment in which people could see all these key definitions and in which they could select what they wanted to do with these key concepts. Um, so what happened is that uh, we gave people instructions in sessions one, session one, and they uh, had 30 minutes to learn 20 key concepts. And they had three study choices. So you could study a key concept, do a test on it, so retrieval practice, or say, I'm done. I don't have to study this uh, item anymore. So in session one, we gave them instructions. Uh, so some people learned about retrieval practice, and you had to do it three times. Others were told about blended learning. We repeated that in session two, so you got instructions plus learning. Um, but the crucial uh, session, just in, as in Carpicky and uh, Ariel study, was in session three, when people got no instructions at all, and we were we uh, were interested in what would happen there. Would people still would people use retrieval practice more often in that uh, session uh, in this condition than in the other condition? And what we found is what you see here. Um, uh, what we found is that the number of study actions was approximately um, similar for two groups. However, the number of test actions was significantly, significantly higher in the experimental group than in the control group. They also uh, asked for uh, more, they, they also answered more often because it was a two-step procedure. You could say, I would test myself without providing the answer. But in this case, the experimental group 